Hello and welcome to another episode of Isn't That Something? I'm Ralph Crew, and today we're doing something very different than normal. This is a long form video version of the podcast. Isn't that something? You can check that out up here or I'll uh, leave a link down in the description. Today we are going to be talking about the planet Mars, which is headed into opposition and to teach us more about what that is and why Mars is awesome. I got the incredible Fraser Kane to spend some time with me. So without any further ado, here's Fraser. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome to Isn't That Something, uh, somebody who has shared an awful lot of things that make you want to say, isn't that something? Uh, Fraser Kane runs Universe Today, which is just an eye-opening uh, sort of rabbit hole of outer space news, uh, whether it's cosmological or if it's planetary or in, in basically the, the whole universe. Well, there it is. It's right in the name. Anyway, it's right there Fraser, in the name. Thank you for uh, taking some time to talk to me today. Happy to be here, Ed. So um, the reason I wanted to talk to you today is to talk about something, uh, you know, relatively nearby uh, in terms of outer space. I guess it's yeah. still millions of miles. But... <laughs> yeah, tens of millions of kilometers away, <laughs> but sure, it's nearby. Right. Uh, and that is the planet Mars. Um, so Mars is doing something uh, on Tuesday. It'll be in opposition. I was wondering if you could just let us know, what is that? Well, opposition, that's one of those terms in astronomy that means something fairly special to astronomers. And that is when you imagine all of the planets in the sun orbiting around in the, in the solar system, when, and you know, sometimes the earth is on one side of the sun and Mars is on the other side of the sun. And then every now and then, every, approximately every two years, the earth and Mars get very close together and it gets brighter and it's sort of the best time to send spacecraft to Mars. You know, mathematically, specifically speaking, opposition is the point when if you drew a straight line, you go from the sun, through the earth, through Mars, when all three objects are nicely lined up, Mars is in opposition. It is in opposition of the sun. And so we stand up, we look in one direction, we see the sun, we turn exactly 180 degrees around, we look in the other direction, we see Mars, and they are in opposition with each other. And that happens with other planets too, but it seems like it's a bigger deal when it happens with Mars. Why is that? Well, I mean, we get an opposition um, with some of the planets, they come more often depending on how quickly they're orbiting the, the sun. But the way Mars and Earth work, because both are moving, I mean, Mars takes about twice as long. It takes 687 days to go around the, the sun. So it takes roughly double what we do. And so we complete two orbits of the sun and Mars completes one orbit of the sun. And the way things line up, this opposition reoccurs every two years. And so it's, I don't know, it's like, it's just long enough for us to forget that Mars is awesome. And then suddenly there's Mars again, but it's not like it takes so long that we have to we have to wait but it's weird because i know what you mean it's like the the oppositions of saturn and jupiter happen more often because they're moving more slowly and so suddenly there's jupiter again bright in the sky there's saturn in your telescope but mars because it's because it's moving much more quickly it's tricky and we gotta we gotta catch up to it yeah and it also seems like there's a bigger difference with Mars, right? Like, I feel like every time I see Jupiter, it's always pretty bright. But sometimes Mars is real, like a little dinky red spot in the sky. Yeah, and right yeah. now, Mars is on fire. Mars is yeah. brighter than Jupiter. There's so a great simulation, and I, and I forget who, who did it. Um, uh, it was on Twitter, and he just showed all of the different planets as they get bigger and smaller over the course of two years. And you can just see, like, most of them stay roughly the same. Venus makes is pretty surprising as it gets bigger and smaller. But also it goes through these phases. And so it, even though it's actually quite large, it's, it's sort of moving to become this very thin crescent. But Mars is sort of like out of nowhere, just, just gets enormous in the sky. And, and it's funny. I love every couple of years, especially when Mars is closest to the moon. I look on Twitter and you get all these people going like, how come I never noticed that bright star next to the moon? And of course, uh, Mars is moving. The moon is moving. It's not a star. <laughs> you didn't notice because you're not paying attention to what happens in the night sky. And, um, and so I love to just go, like, that's not a star. That's Mars. Yeah. And, and 
Mars seems so dynamic compared to some of the other planets too. Like it really flies around the sky at this time of year. Yeah, yeah, and 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 of course, this is one of the the big discoveries that was made to help understand that all of the planets are orbiting around the sun and not orbiting around the Earth. Because if all of the the planets were orbiting around the the Earth, you would expect them just to make these nice paths through the sky all the time and yet the ancient astronomers knew that that all of the planets would go sometimes they would reverse direction and they would go backwards in the sky retrograde and then they would keep moving back in their normal direction and now when you sort of when you understand that both you and mars are orbiting around the sun and when you look at them into the background of the stars you can see this path that they carve out in our in our sort of cosmic horizon and in fact this is beautifully explained by the fact that the planets are taking these elliptical orbits around the sun. And it just took uh, a while for people to figure, to figure this out. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and it makes sense, right? Like it's, uh, you know, as bright as it is, it's still a point in the sky and the motion it, you have to observe for days on end to actually really see it. But it, if you do, it is mm-hmm. really striking. Um, yeah. If people want to like see Mars in person, what should they do? Well, right now, the best time to see Mars is to go out, look to the east, um, a, you know, like an hour or two after sunset, it's it's starting to rise up in the, in the east. And again, because it's at opposition, and it's roughly the closest that it gets to the Earth. It's not exactly the closest that it gets to the Earth. Like, there's sort of more um, sort of fine-tuning about when Mars is actually its closest to the Earth, when it's at its closest to the Sun. But opposition is roughly the time when it's the closest to the Earth. And, and it's, you're seeing it illuminated face on from the Sun. It's, it's like a full moon, but it's Mars. So you've got Mars both at its closest and also its full illumination. And so it really is just just perfect. And it is this bright, unmistakably red star shining. It doesn't flicker the way stars do. It is just this this beam of red light coming from the east. Yeah, the redness is really striking. Uh, You know, I often struggle to really see the color of astronomical objects, and Mars is not subtle right now. Yeah, not subtle at all. Definitely a red object. And it's a, and and things definitely improve when you do look at it with a telescope. For sure. But it's, but not in the same way that, that some of the other objects do. Like you take a you take a small telescope and you look at Saturn, and Saturn goes from a faint yellowish dot in the sky to a planet with rings, and it is mind blowing. You look at Jupiter and you see the bands across the planet, and you see the you see the moons that are in orbit, the four Galilean moons that that Galileo discovered. You look at Mars, and you're going to see a disk of the planet, and you're probably going to see some some features on the planet that 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 are very different from anything you see really on any other world in the solar system, right? Not nowhere else can you look with your eyeballs and see the, and see these dark patches, the, you know, the different almost, I mean, they look like continents on Mars, but they're, they're just regions of different, different brightness on the planet. And you can see the, the polar ice caps on the North and the South. And these are made of water ice and sometimes a covering of of carbon dioxide, of frozen carbon dioxide as well. And, and, but it is really kind of tricky to make out features. You, your mind sort of plays tricks on you. and You can kind of understand why Percival Lowell thought he was seeing uh, canals on the surface of Mars as the ancient Martians you know, were trying to, yeah. to save the water on the surface of, of Mars. It's, it's hard to kind of um, make Mars settle down in, in the eyepiece and really reveal its, its secrets. But it's, and so again, with Saturn, you see the rings, you're like, whoa, I'm seeing rings. And then maybe you can make up some gaps in the in the rings. With Jupiter, yeah, you definitely see those bands on the planet. Maybe you can see the great red spot. But with Mars, it's tricky. It's orbit, it's rotating. You're seeing different surface features. And, and it really is worthy of spending a lot of time just getting to know, just getting to know when it's at this closest point in the eyepiece. Because it is such a different object than anything else you're going to see in the solar system. Right. And Mars gets moody sometimes, right? Like the weather. Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally changes what it looks like. There are planet wide dust storms there. Yeah. Well, I mean, we lost um, the, the opportunity Rover about this time two years ago because of a planet wide dust storm that kicked up 
and obscured the solar panels um, from being able to collect any light and the rover wasn't able to keep itself warm and it eventually froze and, and the batteries died and it wasn't able to recover from, from not having any, any electricity. And, and absolutely, if you were looking through the eyepiece during that period and looking at Mars, what now looks like relatively crisp features on the surface of Mars would look obscured and faded and dusty. And, and so not only do you get these, the times when it is very clear and you can see all of these really intricate features on Mars, other times you're seeing clouds, you're seeing, you're seeing weather, but not weather like we have on Earth. No. You know, Martian weather. Um, you know, there's no time when we can have a dust storm that will rise up and cover the entire planet. That if you were standing on the surface of the planet of Mars, everything would just be gloomy and red and dark. It would be very bizarre. Yeah. And we don't have anything. You know, you can have that. I mean, I, I know people in, in California experienced with the, with the wildfires, right. pretty brutal change in the atmosphere and the way the light looked. So that gives you a kind of a glimpse of what it would be like to stand on the surface of Mars during one of those dust storms. Right, but it's the whole planet. There. But it's that's the whole a, planet. Where another, you go, yeah. That's yeah. another deal. Um, and, you know, I love that you mentioned uh, Opportunity. Rest in peace, maybe my favorite Martian <laughs> yep. uh, rover. Uh, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a, been a lot, maybe more so than any other astronomical target. Uh, Mars is the subject of an enormous amount of study in space programs. Um, why is that? Why, why bother exploring Mars so much more than the other places we could look at? Well, I, I mean, when you think about like what you've got to work with here in the solar system, and for the longest time, everybody thought that if you were going to find some kind of life anywhere else in the solar system, you wanted a place that was going to be like the Earth. And the place that's the closest to being like the Earth is Mars. Now, it's a distant, remote awful place compared to the earth, <laughs> yes. you know, with, with uh, a fraction, 1% of the atmospheric density with 35% of the gravity with a much lower mass, no volcanism, uh, clearly no liquid water on the surface of Mars, deadly radiation that's falling down on the planet. Um, no magnetosphere to protect it from the radiation that's going on. Like it's Mars has Mars is terrible, but uh, but except for all the others, you know, you've got right. Venus with 90 times atmospheric pressure and temperatures hot enough to melt lead. And you've got Jupiter, which, you know, like that's just a ball of hydrogen and helium. Yeah. Same, thing with, same thing with Saturn. And then maybe you've got ice with Neptune and, Neptune and, and Uranus. So there's really no place in the solar system that even has the potential for the existence of liquid water, or so we thought anyway, um, for the longest time, then Mars. And so Mars has just been the, the best hope, the best place that, that astronomers or astrobiologists thought you could go to, to try to get some hint that there was some kind of, of life on Mars. And maybe not life today, but maybe there was life there in the ancient past, maybe a time when Mars was warmer and wetter, and maybe it did have a thicker atmosphere, and it was able to hold on to that atmosphere, and you could have had conditions that, that would have been conducive for life. You know, I am thrilled about all the Mars exploration that's happened, but I think there are some folks who, you know, even after hearing what you've said, they, they say, you know, why bother or why invest resources? Yeah. What would you say to some people like that? Well, I mean, I, uh, maybe 20 years ago, I would have argued heavily. Now, with the incredible discoveries of liquid oceans underneath the shell of Europa and Enceladus and the possibility that there are actually um, subsurface liquid oceans across the entire solar system. There could be more of these than there's, than there's dry land. Um, those are really exciting. And so now it's a question of like, do we want to go search for life in Europa or do we want to go search for life on Mars? Right. But Mars is still very tantalizing, not necessarily on the surface, but is, you know, there's mounting evidence. I mean, we know there's still water. I mean, you look at the polar ice caps, that's frozen water. Um, there's some pretty great spacecraft that are at Mars right now that are able to scan and penetrate deep under the surface of Mars. And they found lakes of, of water underneath the, the surface of Mars. Places that if you could, you know, if you could actually go down and, and get and reach them, 
that that they would be very similar to the kinds of subsurface lakes that we have here on here on earth possibly saltier and you know maybe some kind of briny environment as opposed to like crystal clear pure liquid water but still environments that we know life can thrive here on on earth so when you look at the number of places, you know, we know that here life on earth, wherever we find liquid water, we find life. When we look at Mars and really anywhere across the solar system, anywhere where there is liquid water is a place that needs to be searched. And that place is going to be Mars. And it even isn't, you know, if it's not even today, then, then maybe it was in the past. And maybe by looking at the, surface of Mars, digging under, into, into the regolith on Mars, trying to understand the history of Mars, we will understand just what happened to life in the solar system itself. Did life ever form on Mars? Was there a common ancestor to us here on Earth? Um, is it anything like Earth life? Is it completely different from Earth life? So there's a lot of really big questions that need, can only be answered by extensively searching Mars. And it's like the most fundamental question, really humanity, you know, I consider to be the most important scientific question that we can possibly ask. Are we alone in the universe? Right. Is there life anywhere but Earth? And right now we have no evidence that there is life anywhere else. And so why not look at one of the closest planets to us to find out if there's anything there? It's totally worth searching. Right. And I find it so interesting. Um, so let's say we find some evidence of life on Mars. The implications of that are totally different depending on what we find, right? And yeah, I absolutely. think that's really neat. Like if we find RNA or DNA based life, then maybe that's evidence of a common ancestor. You know, there's the whole panspermia mm -hmm. the life on earth came from life on Mars uh, thought going on out there. But if it's totally different, then that implies that life might be really common in mm -hmm. the universe. Right. And, uh, and then of course, if it is, then where is everybody? So it's, right? it's a, it's a tremendous puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but you can't start to dismantle this puzzle until you start searching for life on Mars. And I feel like Mars is particularly good also at just inspiring, you know, young people to get into science in the first place. And maybe they don't all end up being Martian scientists, but they go into, you know, this whole uh, wide world of STEM over. I like to think of astronomy and space and planetary science stuff as sort of like the gateway drug to STEM fields, yeah. right? And science, I, science fiction and, you know. Star Trek and Star Wars was was our inspiration, and so you know, same thing for the the next generation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, w uh, one thing that was when I was a kid getting into science was science fiction at the time was this uh, you know bodies of water on Mars, and you you briefly mentioned it, but some of this is like pretty recent news, right? Yeah, I mean, we've probably known that there are subsurface lakes on Mars. We, we've known that there's extensive subsurface water, frozen water on Mars now for probably a decade. We've probably, they've detected these subsurface lakes within the last couple of years. And in fact, three new lakes were found just uh, within the last few months now. So we're, um, the evidence is really mounting that there is, that there is a lot of water on Mars reasonably close to the surface. I mean, right you know, hundreds of meters, if not kilometers down, but still yeah, you know, if you better like, than trying to get it on Europa. Right, right. Not like miles and miles. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or, you know, uh, it's if you had the right stuff, I guess you could go scuba diving on Mars, right? Like, it's, yeah, I mean, it yeah, would be so, tough you to know, get there, but. Well, that's the thing. So you need to send, you know, I always joke that you need to send a Bruce Willis and, and team <laughs> to Mars to do a deep drill to get through a kilometer of regolith, which is, a, which is a tricky proposition just to do here on planet Earth. Right. To do that on, to do that on Mars is next level. And it's, it's going to take human beings. Like it's, we don't yeah. have, you know, it's going to take a deep drilling crew with a drill and bits and, and fixing mechanical problems. Like it is going to be a really, at this point, I think we're seeing poor insight desperately trying to deploy its temperature probe that just keeps bouncing out of the regolith. <laughs> um, and that's just to go down like three meters. Right. So to go hundreds, if not hundreds of meters below the surface of Mars to get at this water. But if you could, like if you, if you reached one of those here on earth, you would find life in it. It's right. thought that there's possibly more life underground on earth in total mass than there is life above the surface of the earth. 
which that also that like melts my brain right like we're just the icing on the cake of life yeah and like most of it is not even up here yeah people always worry about you know us wiping out life on earth but but there's so much life on earth we can't wipe out life on earth we can just wipe ourselves out yeah we could take a bunch of neighborhood a little bit but yeah yeah take a bunch of species with us but there's so much life on on earth that that and so the question is i mean if again if you've got an entire subsurface biosphere on planet earth the just you know meters below our feet does the same environment exist on mars and and the big question was always was there is there water and the answer is yeah lots so you know your move science yeah, and speaking of science making moves, there's a there's a spacecraft on the way to Mars right now, right? Uh, the Perseverance rover. And it's yeah, and we there. talked about yeah, we talked about opportunity. And so, uh, if you kind of remember, and I, so I was a child of the of the Viking era. I was like yeah. six years old or whatever when the Viking landers arrived on on Mars. And one of the things that the Viking landers were equipped with was this was a was an experiment designed to test whether or not there was life on on Mars right now today. It was a very audacious experiment. They they had a shovel. They scooped up a bunch of Martian regolith from two different locations, dumped it into like a little um, a little beaker, uh, gave it. Uh, various chemicals and water and then detected the chemicals gases that were emanating out of the out of the regolith to tell them oh what do you know there's actually some kind of active life going on and all it required was a little bit of chemistry and a little bit of a you know a, a snack and it, the life would get rolling except that the the results of that experiment have been in just enormous controversy for decades and you're going to have some people who are absolutely certain that they saw life in the viking experiments and other people who says no way there's plenty of perfect perfectly natural explanations for for what caused that life and so nasa learning a very powerful life lesson said okay 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 we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna search for life on mars very carefully and we're gonna build up the case for life on mars and so the the first spacecraft to really help figure this out were Spirit and Opportunity, those two solar powered rovers. We, you know, once again, uh, you know, we just lost Opportunity within the last yeah. uh, couple of years, and their job was to find out if there was just ever liquid water on the surface of Mars. I mean, we see these these what look like river deltas from space. We see evidence of what looks like the effect of water, but maybe it was it was glaciers or or sand running down hills and things like that, but Spirit and Opportunity independently many times discovered the kinds of minerals and chemistry that showed us that, yes, indeed, there was water on the surface of Mars at some point in the ancient past. And so to follow on with that exploration, Curiosity went, and this is, of course, the, the, the much larger rover equipped with its own nuclear battery, and its job was to say, okay, if assuming that there was water on Mars, was there water on Mars for a long time? Like the amount of time that you could have had life form. And Curiosity turned out that yes, indeed, there was uh, regions that it visited in, the, in the, the crater that it was traveling in where there was liquid water acting there for long periods of time, long enough for their, you know, so that, that Mars was wet and warm and just a nice place for life for a very long period of time. And so then the next question in this story is, okay, were there the kinds of environments and chemistry and chemicals and nutrients available for life? And this is the question that Perseverance is going to, to answer. And so Perseverance is the, is the twin of, of opportunity. It has very similar structure. It looks, very, it looks identical, but it has different um, chemistry experiments and different kinds of science packages that it has and so its job is to now look for the kinds of chemicals that were present in the martian rocks at the time to look at the kinds of maybe um uh, the outgassing, the kinds of uh, just the remnants left behind over these long periods of time and say, was this an environment that was conducive for life or was it toxic and poisonous and, and no life could, could survive? It's, got, it's equipped with a microscope that's more capable than anything that's come before. It can look, it can peer down inside rocks and and Perseverance's other job is to collect samples. So it's going to be gather, driving along, picking up samples from the surface of Mars, 
sort of chewing on them, studying them for a bit, and then dropping other samples behind it on the on the surface. And so at some point, a follow-on mission that's now sort of being designed right now, a sample return mission will follow Perseverance in its tracks and just pick up all of those packages that it left behind, put them on a rocket and send them back home to Earth. And then the scientists can study all of these different samples from all of these different places on the surface of Mars in their laboratory back on Earth. Yeah, and uh, that that you know the idea of bringing pieces of Mars back to Earth yeah. is really thrilling. There's also there's one other program on on uh, Perseverance that is more of a proof of concept than anything. It's not so much for science today, but just showing that it might work. Which is there's a helicopter that's yeah. going along with it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and this is sort of like one of these last minute additions to the to the rover. Uh, it turns out like Mars is, you know, has 1% the atmospheric density of Earth, but it has a very low gravity. And it turns out that if you have a helicopter with the right size, battery powered, it can actually fly for very brief periods of time in the Martian atmosphere before having to set down again. And so they have attached a helicopter and it's actually, I was sort of imagining it was actually fairly small, but it's actually quite large, right? Tucked underneath the un, underneath perseverance. And so one of the first things that perseverance will do as it starts to get to work is it will, it will sort of detach this, um, this helicopter from from underneath it and place it gently down on the surface of Mars and then drive away from it. And then when they're ready, this thing will will fill up its its battery with its solar panel. And when the battery is full, it will take off and attempt to maneuver and attempt to take some pictures and try to just sort of scout out the the Martian landscape. And then it's going to land again. Um, and then it's going to refill its solar panel, refill its battery, and then try to do another hop, however long it takes to do that. Now, we know what's going to happen, right? You know, anyone's ever owned a quadcopter, do you crash your drone within... within flight two or three. At flight the two or three, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so to be, <laughs> to be in a place where, where there's no human operator and the thing is attempting to, to navigate a, a dangerous Martian terrain, I, I'd be amazed if they get more than two or three flights out of it. But... But this idea of having a, a scout that could come along with your rover and be able to, to see the landscape from above and help to, to, to see a better perspective. I mean, geologists love to, to have a bird's eye view of the place that they're looking to be able to see where the, you know, the different rock formations begin and end and how they mix and how, the, you know, how this part um eroded into that part and so to be able to the potential of having a flying vehicle on mars that's going along for the ride is is just a stunning one of the best parts of this mission yeah it's it's i mean it'll be the first time in history that there's an aircraft on another planet yeah uh, which is just amazing uh, i could talk to you about mars all day this stuff really gets me going and uh, i love your both your like in-depth knowledge and passion for it and you can make anybody excited about it uh, for those who there's there's probably like one percent of people who watch my stuff who haven't heard of yours, but for the one tiny little bit, um, how do people find out more about what you're up to? Yeah, well, I mean, the the best thing, of course, is that I I'm the publisher of Universe Today. So if you come to our website, then then we're covering tons of news, every little update on on everything about Mars for sure, as well as everything else in the universe. Um, I'm also the co-host of the Astronomy Cast podcast with Dr. Pamela Gay. And I do a, a pile of videos on my YouTube channel, all about space and astronomy, live question shows, special interviews with guests, and then a lot of deep dives into various missions like Perseverance and the Mars helicopter. So uh, if you want to learn more about space and astronomy, uh, I have got you covered. Fantastic. Well, Fraser, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me today. This is amazing. All right. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks again to Fraser Kane for taking time to talk to me about the planet Mars. I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, now, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and sharing and things like that, both to the video and to the podcast series. Thanks again for listening and watching and explore the world responsibly.